Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 298 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, our next guest is actually coming directly from Oakland University, and the building that they are sitting in right at this moment, I know that exact spot because it is such a beautiful campus, and uh, it's just a beautiful building, very modern, very sleek, and the students, the students at Oakland University, I have spoken at Oakland, and they were absolutely magnificent, so I am jealous, and I can't wait to get back <laughs> to campus. Now, our next guest is... Angie Freeman is the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. There, they coordinate various diversity and inclusion related events and programs, such as Heritage Month celebrations and the Diversity Lecture Series, as well as numerous summer programs that are available for some of the area youth. Born in Germany and having lived several places as a self-described military brat, Angie earned a bachelor's degree in marketing from Oakland University. They also earned a master's degree in college student affairs from Nova Southeastern University. Not only do they have a passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also in dance. Welcome to the show, Angie. Yeah. <laughs> What's that up? I'm awesome. available. I mean, if you want me to come, you know, and just introduce you on stages all across the country, I'm available. I'm just look. Saying. That was that was great. I I, I think <laughs> I think we should use this, uh, you know, as a as a standard from now on. This that was awesome. <laughs> Love the energy. <laughs> that, that was pretty dope. There's no question. All right. So you chose Oakland University for your undergraduate experience. Tell our audience what made Oakland the right choice for you. Oh, Oakland, uh, you know, <laughs> some of it had to do with the influence of my mom. Uh, shout out to my mother. Um, you know, just wants the best for me, right? And so we came and did a, a, a tour, and uh, she was just like, yep, this is the one. We went up these, uh, it, it's in this building too, these these giant stairs that go up to like the ballrooms, right, where, you know, they have the reception and all that. Um, and, uh, you know, I just remember it vividly, but I think the um, it being close fairly close to home. Um, we lived in Detroit. Um, and so it was like about, I don't know, 40 minutes uh, drive, right? Uh, north of Detroit. So it wasn't that far, but it was far enough to where I can be like, all right, ma, okay, let me, let me, let me blossom over here. And then I can come see you when I want to. Um, <laughs> so uh, that had a lot to do with it as well. And um, I mean, they, they wanted me. So I was like, cool. Um, I only had like a few offers. Um, and so uh the beautiful thing about this campus is it's on the hills, right? Um, Rochester Hills or uh, Auburn Hills, and uh, you know it's it's lively. I'm I'm here right now. I want to go outside. <laughs> yeah. It is stunning just walking around campuses. You got this cool little bridge. I mean, it's just so yeah. Cool. The bridge definitely the bridge, it goes over man. to the residence halls. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. Love that bridge over there. It's so beautiful, really. I mean, if you ever get an opportunity to take a look at the hills. Uh, over at Oakland University. Please just walk the campus. It really is beautiful. The flowers, the trees. I mean, it's alive. You just yeah, feel great yeah. just walking that campus. Um, For sure. So I'm a little bit jealous, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Oakland, you know, a little bit further away from Detroit, so you can kind of do your own thing without interference from the parents. <laughs> and so I yeah, get yeah. it. I mean, and I did the same I thing. I stayed on too. campus too, so it was it was, it was even a, a better experience. Um, I would encourage anyone, if you could stay on campus, uh, it definitely makes for a lot of like just independence and just figuring life out, you know, you're young. And um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I love it. And after grad school at Nova Southeastern and College Student Affairs, you decided to be a resident director at the University of Vermont. So why was that particular position exciting for you that made you want to <laughs> jump and go to Vermont? Because it was so diverse, nah. <laughs> um, <laughs> with literally like 98.7% white, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of people ask me like, why, you know, why uh, Vermont? And so what really stood out to me is the the program 
um, within residents' life and and just their their vision and their attack uh, to social justice. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> they have a really strong uh, social justice and inclusion. Uh, program that infused the work that they did in residents' life, which I thought was amazing. I mean, talking about restorative practices, um, you know, which is a tool that uh, we use for any harm that's been done in the community. <clears throat> and, and, you know, in our sense, it could be uh, on our floors. So me working with the, the RAs, you know, um, they're, they're kids and students do a lot of stuff in the residence halls, right? Um, so if any harm has been done, like instead of like a punitive approach, you know, we use a, more of a restorative approach and, you know, bringing everyone together. How did this impact you? And, you know, as the, the neighbor of this person who, you know, um, ruined our, um, um, you know, our furniture in the lounge, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really like making that person feel, um, still part of the community right like a lot of times we we do this and we say go over there you know think about what you did or like you're excluded from us now because you know you did wrong or um you know you get some kind of punitive response and that's not always that's not always effective mm -hmm. we want the person to feel like um you know you're still valued even though you messed up this furniture and you scraped holes in it whatever it was um like understand how you how your actions have impacted the, the people around you, right? And the people around you care about you. So anyway, um, so that's just a small uh, example of what, what excited me about it and what drew me to it because I knew I wanted to do diversity and inclusion work. And so, um, you know, like the, that, that really drew me um, to, to Vermont in a still like a residence life kind of, uh, environment because that's where I came from you know at Oakland I was an RA and you know did all these things on campus so mm -hmm. um, but to do it also in that environment where it was almost 100% white right mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think made a huge difference even with the RAs that we um, that we advise right like getting them to understand um, white privilege and you know what what kind of um, you know advantages that they walk through life with that that they might not realize and some some of that's you know earned privilege some of it's not um just you know just because of who they are right and so um getting the RAs to realize that um was was definitely challenging but it was also uh I think just life altering in some kind of ways or at least an aha moment for them like ooh okay yeah you're right like I don't have to think about you know when I'm walking at night in a certain area, like I don't have to like look around or see like, okay, what am I wearing? Is it okay? You know, so different things like that, like getting them to realize that was um, something that I wanted to do yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to be a part of that. And I'm, I, I wouldn't have done that differently either. Um, I was there for a year. It was a great year um, where I, you know, kind of turned my, career around which we'll talk about too <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to but um you know why uh, I was only there for a year and kind of what I did after that yeah I bet those conversations were fascinating because I'm sure a lot of those students and even you know the other RAs they probably never really had any of those DEI uh conversations about white privilege for example that was probably the mm -hmm. first time they ever talked about it in their yeah. lives you know exactly exactly um, like so. oh like I worked hard to get here and I, I did this and you know I also come from a poor neighborhood you know all these kind of responses right but it's oh, like yeah. <clears throat> um you know if it, it, yes and yes <laughs> but just understand that you know you also you know walk through life a little bit differently and and, and that's the part that they don't understand so but yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's so all fascinating, fascinating to me. I mean, you start talking about white privilege and then automatically people start going to, oh, you're saying I didn't work hard to get here? And you're like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Right, you know, I right. know you worked hard to get here. But we automatically go there. Like, that's like the first automatic response. Sure, um, sure. Oh, it's just so fascinating. Well, you know, the other thing that's interesting is that dance seemed to be calling your name because you trained hard on hip hop, stepping, body percussion, why do you feel called to this passion of dance? And what are some of the difficulties that you've experienced along the way? Ooh, how much time do we have now? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I've been dancing all my life, uh, just 
I'm a self-trained dancer, street dancer, just kind of looking at other artists um, and and kind of learning from that. My my older brother is also a dancer, which I have learned some from, mm -hmm. a professional dancer. But um, even at Oakland, like I, I dance and I started a group here and things like that, but I never um, pursued it professionally. And that's something that I, I was always uh, curious about. Like, can I make this into a profession? You know, can I do this as my job? Because I love it. Like anytime something's going on and I'm in the dance studio, my phone is over there. Like everything shuts off and I'm just in it and I'm doing my thing and it just feels so good. Um, so can I do that and like make it a career? Like that would be dope, right? Um, so I, from Vermont, like I, I kind of realized that and I just dropped everything and I was like, I, if I'm going to do this, I got to do it now. This is, this is the time. And if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. And that's, that's what really made me just make the move. And so I had a lot of support, um, my now wife, but then at the time, uh, uh, partner, she, uh, just had my back and was like, all right, let's go. And we moved dropped everything and moved to LA and I started training and dancing and, you know, getting into the dance industry. I was going to auditions and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I even had an opportunity to, uh, to audition for my favorite artist uh, of all time is Usher. <clears throat> and I got a chance to meet him and everything. And I was like, yes, what? Um, but I did that for a while, but I ran into some challenges because um, like, I don't fit, and so what they're looking for as far as the dance industry and like this um, portrayal of like uh, femininity and like what, you know, um, uh, just the, the, the social construction around like what females should look like, what men should look like and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like I was coming to the audition with like, you know, a tank top and like, you know, some shorts and everything. And they're like, no, we needed you in, in heels and, um, and uh, fishnets and uh, where's your makeup? I'm like, uh, nope. <laughs> so, but like, I wanted to dance with the guys and I wanted to like, you know, just dance in that kind of way. Right. Like, so, um, you know, my, um, my identity as being non-binary and doing a lot of work around um, just my 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 own identity, um, you know, and like at that time, like I uh, started using they them pronouns and, you know, just was discovering myself. And so I like to express myself in more of a masculine way. Right. Mm -hmm. But the dance industry, no, it's like, OK, ladies on this side of the room, men on this side. OK, let's go. And I'm like, I don't want to be on either side. I just I just want to dance. Right. I just can I just dance, you know. So um, I ran into a lot of that and uh, it didn't last very long because <laughs> I wasn't going to change. I, I said, nope. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm I'm sticking true to, to who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, but then I got involved in an organization. Um, named Molati and that's the body percussion uh stepping organization uh and it's a full-on company and we started touring and it was they took me in as I was and they said nah you don't have to wear no dress or anything like what like we we stomping and get around and I come from Greek life too so I'm I'm part of Zeta Sigma Chi and so um you know definitely was familiar with that that art form right sure. so um yeah so that was uh that was kind of my transition into something that would be more for uh, accepting of kind of who I am, but I also get down and get gritty, uh, which is what I wanted to do. I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. That is so cool. All right. So you tried the dance thing. It really didn't go exactly the way that you had planned. That's okay. Um, you actually took a position as a success coach and a retention specialist at Nevada State College. So did that position give you a little bit more clarity on what your career was going to look like? Um. It brought me back to student affairs. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I did want to circle back because you can't be a dancer all your life. Right. <laughs> like the wear and tear on the knees. No. no. Um, so it did. It brought me back to student affairs and um, the passion that I started with, um, even from Oakland University. And so um, I, I, I knew I wanted to get back in that that area. And then advising was just what accepted me at the time I wanted to do diversity and inclusion work um, but with no experience or no professional experience I mean it's kind of hard so yeah. um so yeah so that kind of just 
you know, got me back in the door, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. And then after that, you became a senior transition advisor at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. What's involved with being a senior transition advisor? Like, what do you do? Um, so I help students transfer from the uh, community college okay. to uh, the university, uh, which was a uh, UNLV. Uh, basically, well, UNLV and Nevada State were the main colleges or universities um, in Las Vegas. So, um, but yeah, I just helped them, uh, you know, figure out what the transfer credits and, uh, you know, what that looks like and um, just getting ready for the the big the big game, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a lot with that transition, you know, yeah. that students don't even realize, uh, it's more than just like, Oh, how do my credits transfer? But it's like, you know, uh, thinking about the adjustment period and like, um, you know, the different culture that you're stepping into and expectations and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's a yeah. totally different culture at UNLV versus a community college. I mean, these are like, two totally different animals there um so well thank goodness for transition advisors like you i think that's really important and then finally now today you are the diversity and inclusion coordinator at oakland university and so you coordinate these various diversion um diversity and inclusion related events and programs on campus at oakland so can you walk us through some of the events that you've had on campus Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, so now you're this diversity and inclusion coordinator at Oakland University. Can mm -hmm. you walk us through some of the events that you've had on campus? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so uh, one of the big ones is a diversity lecture series, um, which we bring in speakers um, to come and talk about different social justice and diversity topics, right? Anywhere from <clears throat> race and racism to... Um, to privilege, to um, uh, LGBTQ plus awareness, right? So, but we we infuse it to medicine and healthcare because that's where we are. We're in the medical school, yeah. um, and so um, you know that's one of the big programs that we do. We also do like pathway programs for high school students who are interested in medicine. So we get them young, and we say, hey, like here's you know medicine and you know um you know what you can do with it and like a career you can make out of it and things like that but we get the faculty to come and teach these kids so they get direct exposure um to to you know physicians who are actually doing the work which is really cool uh the kids love it um you know other than that we do a lot of different <clears throat> programs um you know just to celebrate like the heritage months and things like that um just kind of general stuff um yeah, this is this has been great. Like I've been in this role uh, about a year and a half. And um, so I'm like officially doing the work now, like yeah. just with the time. I mean, I've been doing the work for a long time, unofficially just doing different workshops and spreading myself and saying, hey, like, here's my experience and here's uh, what I can bring and talk about. Um, but now it's more official, but I, just, I I've been doing the work for a long time. <laughs> I love it. Well, but I mean, how do you get buy-in for all these initiatives that you're rolling out when maybe not everybody in the administration um, or even the students might not see it as a priority for them? Yeah, this one's a tough one. Um, I bring it back to um, like the vision and mission of the institution, right? Because we all signed up to be here. So you also signed up to um, to to support the mission and and what we want to do as an institution, right? So, and with that, you know, we're trying to provide an uh, an environment for medical students to thrive as future physicians, um, and to do that in a uh, diversity and inclusion, helping them um, make them feel like a sense of belonging, right? And so, you know, I bring it back to that and say, hey, like we're all here on campus, um, doing the same thing, like. In order to do this, we have to um, infuse different diversity and inclusion initiatives, right? Um, and then also, like specifically with the um, the healthcare physicians, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always say because I do a, a session on LGBTQ plus awareness in in healthcare and talk about disparities and all that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I tell them, I say, things are evolving, things are changing, evolving. Um, you know, and I I want you to be on 
the train with us, <laughs> you know, like, don't, don't be stuck, um, you know, left behind and say, oh, well, you're, you're not up to speed. I'm going to go over here. Right. Um, but I, I want to be on the train. I want to be, you know, kind of keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. So that way people can uh, reach out to me and, and look for me in that sense. Um, I want to be the one with the new forms that have been uh, changed to be more inclusive on asking people's pronouns, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of I, I, to get that buy and I try to I try to create an incentive for them or, or say like, okay, this is important because, and it should be important to you because of this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're like, Oh yeah, I, I, I do. <laughs> I do think that's important. And I want to be, everybody wants to be right. They, they want to be a part of something, something bigger or something that's changing. But okay. So let's take it to like a student organization or something like that. I mean, give us the why, why <laughs> is training on unconscious bias or microaggressions? Why would that be important to a student organization or, or a company for that matter? It should be. <laughs> we, I, I agree, but you got to tell yeah, me. Why. Yeah, we, yeah, of course. Um, we all have bias. We all have bias. Every, if you don't think that you do, I would, you know, encourage you to, <laughs> to, you know, to, to reconsider that. But, um, you know, in bias, I, I, I always like to tell people it could be positive or negative. Um, it doesn't, when we think of bias, we always think of negative, like, oh, like you have a bias toward this, or you think, you know, differently about this, but it could also be positive, you know, like I know you, right. And so now if I see you somewhere, like my bias is, oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, of course, um, let's, let's get them on the thing. Or, you know, I have some sort of a kind of a buy-in now just because I, I, I met you and I know you. Right. Um, but when we talk about those biases that, impact us when we make decisions on hiring practices and um you know we um um things that are by a uh, biases is, is is um um it becomes an issue i'll say um when your bias impacts how you maneuver in life or how you interact with a certain person or a group of people right um you know we have things that we know about certain groups or things that we're taught that most of the time are wrong and inaccurate, but we use that information to say, oh, well, I'm not going to go over there because I know how this group is or, you know, um, just, you know, any anything that we would um, let like impact us negatively or directly with that person. So um, I think any institution should be, um, should be wanting to know more about uh, bias and how that impacts um, you as an institution, individual and everything, right? Like we, a lot of things are so socially constructed and we don't even know, like it wasn't until I started doing this work that I, I even realized how socially constructed things are um, that we understand, right? Um, whether it's race or whether it's uh, gender, you know, uh, anything like that. Um, we've, as a society, we've kind of created what we expect of people on how they should look, dress, sound, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important for any organization to understand that um, and to know where your bias is, because it's, 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 okay. it's easy to say like, oh, well, you have a certain bias against this or people in general think negatively about these groups. No, where do you have the bias? That's where I want to challenge organizations uh, to think about. Um, and, you know, my kind of bigger philosophy on social justice and change is that we have to look at ourselves first. You know, yeah, we can go to different cultural celebrations and we can celebrate and we can learn about um, different um, uh, cultures and all that. But like we're, we still have baggage. <laughs> we still have the ways that we think about those groups and we still let that um um, impact our decision making so where are you coming from and that's kind of my my thing so I get you know when I do my um, talks on like privilege I talk about all privilege not just white privilege which is the most common one right, right. but I talk about ability privilege I talk about um, you know citizenship right like we have you know so much privilege and just being a citizen of this country um, things that we don't have to think about and all that stuff so I'm like if I can think about that even as a person of color myself as a queer person non-binary like it, it's easy to focus on like 
where I'm discriminated against because I am, mm-hmm. but where do I have privilege and where do I have um, some of that um, uh, advantage, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I that that's just kind of like my philosophy on that. I'm always doing self work. Um, I'm always challenging myself, even as marginalized and intersectional identities that I have, you know. <laughs> yeah. I love all of that. And, you know, one last thing I wanted to ask you, if students find themselves as the DEI chair in their organization, because I've seen this new role kind of pop up in fraternities and sororities and councils, et cetera, or maybe a student just wants to bring a space of inclusion to their campus, where should they start this journey in terms of tackling this objective of DEI? Hmm. Two two things come to mind. Um, one is like a a partner or, or somebody who can advocate, uh, whether it's like a staff, faculty, somebody um, who can hear out what you have to say, um, who can like support you and 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 give you some type of leverage um, in kind of knowing who to talk to and things like that. Um, the other one is assessment. Like, like talk to your community about what's going on. What's the current culture? What's the current current climate? What are the needs, right? Like you can, anybody can come up with an idea, but if it's not specifically what the community needs or what the challenges are, then it's not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so find out from your peers and, and, and everybody, because then that gives you some kind of leverage too on saying, hey, my peers, I interviewed like 25 or whatever, 25, I'm just throwing out a number, uh, people, and they said the same thing, that we need X, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then now you have uh, something to build on. Um, but I really feel like it, it comes from the community. And also, talking about that buy-in you talked about earlier, when the community says, hey, this is what we need and here's the issues, when we address it, then there becomes more of that buy-in um, to either support it or either, um, uh, you know, pass it along or build it up or, you know, whatever it is. But then there's like, they feel like they're a part of it. They feel like they're a part of that solution as opposed to that. Ah, they're doing something over there. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm just going to see what the outcome is. No, I want to be on the forefront because I helped come up with this, um, this, uh, these challenges or these issues. So, mm-hmm. I love it. Very, very good answers. I love all of it. Now, I do love good food. That's one thing you need to know about me. I love to eat good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. So the next time I am on campus and I'm at Oakland (laughs) University, where do I go to get a great meal in Rochester, Michigan? (laughs) Oh, man. Um, So a a, a good one and a common one. I mean, it's... (laughs) <laughs> uh buddy's pizza like and and it, and it seems kind of like oh pizza ah, whatever but they have a lot of um uh options for people who have different kind of um dietary uh you know uh preferences right mm-hmm. so they have like vegan options uh vegetarian of course but it's we order from there for our students because it has that variety and, and it's good pizza like if you want some like not the uh what do you call it? Uh, not commercialized businesses, but uh, franchises. Local. Yeah, yeah. Like if you don't, the local. Yes, if you want something local and something good. Uh, yeah, buddies, buddies is good, and it, and it's for everyone. Like you can, you know, anyone with any kind of uh, food. Can, can go there so i'm gonna try buddies but i gotta warn you i was born in new york city in manhattan okay oh I know man you're gonna bring that pizza, in and you're telling me <laughs> in michigan to go to buddy's pizza and so i'm already a little suspicious okay? look i'm look, walking look. into this a little suspicious about this i know i know look i can't beat i can't beat the new york pizza and, no, and the no, chicago pizza and all that nah. you can try but you're gonna fail yeah <laughs> <laughs> Dang, you had to bring up the New York. <laughs> it's all good. It's, all, it's good. all good. All right. So listen, if our student listeners have questions for you or they're interested in having you to come speak on their campus, where should they go to connect with you? Yeah. So uh, let's see. You can contact me at uh, Angie Freeman. That's A-N-G-I-E, F as in French fry, (laughs) R-E-E-M-A-N, 1124 at gmail.com. There you go. And so, yeah, you can contact me there um, and uh, 
again, I use they, them pronouns, and I, I, I would love to, to hear from anyone that has any questions or just any comments about what I've said today. Uh, I'm always learning and growing from other people, and they might add something to what I said and say, hey, did you think about this? I'm like, oh, no, nah, that's that's great. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that about you. I'm also a lifelong learner. I'm just starting my journey now on a doctorate and uh, something I never really thought about. Um, but here we yes. are. Right? So, uh, so yeah, so I'm with you. I, I could always learn more. I can always improve. Never in a million years do I think that I've just, you know, reached the pinnacle. I never feel that way ever. I always think that there's, you know, another mountain to climb and, and more to learn because I don't know everything. And the more I learn, you know, the more I realize what I don't know. Mm. <laughs> right? So anyway, that's the way I feel. And I, hopefully all of our listeners are going to commit themselves to being a lifelong learner too. So I appreciate all of your openness, your honesty, and, uh, and boy, oh boy, what a great wealth of information. What a great resource for the students at Oakland University. They are very lucky to have you. Appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Angie, please like it. Please share it on social media with other college students. And we look forward to seeing you on another episode of the <laughs> Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. And we are going to see you next time. Yeah.